world of wastewater. Hello and welcome. You're watching part 18 in a series going over a wastewater exam that you can find a link to in the description below. If you're following along, these questions are numbers 86 through 90. If you've had a group of sky rats eating the scum off your primaries for so long that they should be honorary operators, then hit like and subscribe. With that said, let's get started. Anaerobic decomposition of wastewater produces which gas? A. Ammonium chloride B. Hydrogen sulfide C. Oxygen D. Ferric chloride The answer is B. Hydrogen sulfide when wastewater is decomposed in an environment without oxygen, a process known as anaerobic decomposition occurs. During this process, specialized bacteria break down the organic matter in wastewater, producing various gases. One of the most common and recognizable gases produced is hydrogen sulfide, which is also commonly referred to by its chemical formula, H2S. Hydrogen sulfide is a colorless gas with a strong, unpleasant odor, often described as similar to rotten eggs. It is highly toxic and can be dangerous if inhaled, even in relatively low concentrations, which is why it is extremely important that you always, always, always use a properly calibrated and functioning gas detector when entering confined spaces. A WAS pump is set to 2.7 gallons per stroke, with 40 strokes per minute. How long will it take to pump 3,750 pounds per day if the WAS concentration is 5%? A. 52 minutes B. 67 minutes C. 83 minutes D. 90 minutes The answer is C. 83 minutes before I jump right into this, I would like to say there are a few different ways you could perform the math on this question. If you did the math in a different way on your own and got the correct answer, keep doing it that way. There is no wrong way if you are getting the right answer. I'm going to follow steps that are in line with how we've tackled math problems so far in this series. You know what happens next. It's time for a math breakdown. In this question, we are asked, how long will it take to pump 3,750 pounds of solids contained in the waste-activated sludge per day? And the answer needs to be in minutes. We are given some important information, such as the pump moves 2.7 gallons per stroke, the pump works at 40 strokes per minute, and the WAS concentration is 5%. The very first step I would take is to convert the sludge concentration, which is given to us as a percentage, and convert that into milligrams per liter, which we will use in a couple steps from now. I have the conversion rate on the screen, and as I've said in other videos, this is given to you on your exam, but I recommend you just remember that 1% is equal to 10,000 milligrams per liter. So with that said, our 5% sludge concentration is equal to 50,000 milligrams per liter. For the second step, I'm going to calculate the pumping rate that this pump is moving sludge at. I solve for this by using the 2.7 gallons per stroke multiplied by 40 strokes per minute. This gives us an answer of 108 gallons per minute. For the third step, I want to take the pumping rate of gallons per minute and convert it to million gallons per minute. This will allow us to use it in a loading rate formula. So let's take our 108 gallons per minute and divide that by 1 million. This equals 0 0.000108 million gallons per minute. That might seem like a really small number, but this allows us to put it into the loading rate formula that you see on the screen. I just want to clarify that although the formula shows million gallons per day, the per day part is not always necessary when using this formula. The time unit could be any unit of time, and also recall this formula can simply be used to calculate mass in pounds without any time unit associated with it at all. The important thing to remember is when you use this formula, the flow or volume of water must be converted to million gallons. 
which if you are given gallons, you just divide by 1 million, like I have done on the screen to convert to million gallons. All right, so with that in mind, in step four, we use the loading rate formula to calculate for pounds per minute. Let's take our previous answer of 0 0.000108 million gallons per minute and multiply that by the concentration of sludge from step one, which is 50,000 milligrams per liter, and multiply that by the conversion factor of 8.34 pounds per gallon. This gives us an answer of 45 pounds per minute. In step five, we bring it all together. Now that we've figured out the amount of solids that are being pumped per minute, we can use that rate to figure out how long it will take to pump 3,750 pounds of solids contained in the waste activated sludge. To do this, we simply take the 3,750 pounds per day and divide that by the rate of 45 pounds per minute to get an answer of 83.3 minutes, which I will round down to the whole number of 83, which is our answer, choice C. We are only two questions into this, but I've thrown a lot at you, so just close your eyes, take a couple deep breaths, roll your neck around, and drink some water. I'm serious. It only gets worse from here on out. Okay, you know I'm kidding, but seriously, drink some water. I'm serious. But seriously. I'm serious. Which of the following is a consequence of excessive aeration in an activated sludge system? A. Increased sludge production. B. Decreases denitrification efficiency. C. Poor flock formation and settling. D. There is no such thing as excessive aeration. The answer is C. Poor flock formation and settling. The reason excessive aeration is bad is that it will create too much turbulence within the aeration basin. This causes the flock particles to break apart. Flock particles are the clusters of bacteria and organic matter essential for proper settling and treatment. When flock particles become too small or there are too few of them, they lose the ability to settle effectively in the secondary clarifier, leading to poor settling performance and higher suspended solids in the effluent. Additionally, while not directly related to the question, it's worth noting that aeration is typically the most energy-intensive process at an activated sludge plant. Running aeration systems beyond what's necessary not only disrupts settling, but also results in unnecessary energy consumption and higher operational costs. Optimizing aeration is key to both process efficiency and cost savings. How is the food to microorganism ratio typically adjusted? A, altering the alkalinity of the aeration basin. B, adjusting the sludge wasting rate. C, modifying the return activated sludge rate. D, changing the filter media. The answer is B, adjusting the sludge wasting rate. The food to microorganism ratio, also commonly called food to mass ratio or F2M, represents the amount of BOD or CBOD available relative to the amount of microorganisms in the system. To control this ratio effectively, operators must adjust the sludge wasting rate. On the screen I have the general relationship of how wasting rate impacts the amount of microorganisms within the system and how that ultimately affects the food to microorganism ratio. To know how many microorganisms are in your system, you need to keep track of your mixed liquor volatile suspended solids concentration. When you increase the sludge wasting rate, you remove excess microorganisms from the system, which reduces your biomass with the goal of increasing the food to mass ratio. On the flip side, if you decrease the wasting rate, you retain and grow more biomass, which lowers the food to mass ratio. It's important to understand that just because you increase or decrease your wasting rate, you may not get the results you want. As many of you probably already know, you don't usually have control over what comes into your plant, so it's important to not chase a specific food to mass ratio. You want to aim for staying within a range that works for your system. As a rule of thumb, you should not change your wasting rates more than 10 to 20% per day. You don't want to go chasing your tail trying to hit a specific ratio value. Efficient and effective wastewater treatment is a moving target, and you need to make incremental adjustments to get the results you want. It's all about staying in a range. What may work one week likely won't work exactly the same the next because you never know what's coming down the pipe. 
Alkalinity is a measure of water's ability to a. Neutralize acids, b. Neutralize bases, c. Resist changes in temperature, d. Dissolve organic material. The answer is a. Neutralize acids. Alkalinity is basically water's ability to neutralize acids, which helps keep the pH stable. This buffering capacity comes mostly from carbonate, bicarbonate, and hydroxide ions. Now how do we measure alkalinity? We do that by performing a titration in a laboratory. I'm not going to review that process here, but it is essentially determined by how much acid is required to lower the pH to 4.5, the point at which all the buffering capacity is used up. The result is expressed in milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate. All right, so let's break this down a little bit further to how it actually stabilizes the pH in water. When an acid is introduced into water, it releases hydrogen ions. Normally, this would cause the pH to drop. However, alkalinity acts as a buffer, preventing sudden changes by neutralizing these hydrogen ions. Here's how the buffering process happens. Bicarbonate reacts with hydrogen ions, forming carbonic acid. This carbonic acid doesn't just sit there, it partially breaks down into water and carbon dioxide, helping to absorb the acid's impact. Carbonate also reacts with hydrogen ions, but in this case, it converts it into bicarbonate, adding another layer of buffering capacity. Hydroxide ions neutralize hydrogen ions directly, forming water and preventing pH from dropping too quickly. I want to go over briefly two instances of why alkalinity is important within wastewater operations. The nitrification cycle relies on alkalinity to function properly. Without sufficient alkalinity, ammonia cannot be effectively converted to nitrates. A key fact to remember that may come in handy for your exam is that it takes 7.14 parts of alkalinity to convert one part of ammonia into nitrate. In anaerobic digesters, a delicate balance exists between acid-producing bacteria and methane-producing bacteria. If acid-forming bacteria lower the pH too much, methane-producing bacteria become inhibited, reducing gas production. Maintaining proper alkalinity helps buffer the system, preventing excessive acidity and ensuring stable methane generation. Alkalinity, acidity, and pH are super important concepts for operating a treatment plant, and there are plenty of good resources out there for diving deeper into the subject, so don't be afraid to learn more about these. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then check out the others on this channel. If you want to help us keep making great content for operators, there's a link to donate in the description below, and see you next time on World of Wastewater.